Welcome to the Game of Impossible podcast. My name is Leon and this is my dad, Idris Jala. We are a father-son podcast where we discuss all things transformation through the lens of business, leadership, sport, and faith. Today, we are going to be trying a different format. Um, You know, the first six weeks of our podcast, we did a six-part series uh, on your six secrets of transformation. Today, um, we want to do a more open concept uh, and we'll also be taking in some questions from our audience and from our listeners as well. Um, I thought we could maybe anchor our discussion a bit since we want to take in uh, questions and feedback from our audience. I thought it would be good to talk broadly about topic of um, of feedback. How do we both uh, give but also receive feedback well? Do you have any kind of initial thoughts on on this idea of feedback and the importance of a healthy feedback loop? I think the key question is when people give you questions that they put forward, you must find a way to answer the questions. There's a lot of people that evade answering the question, however difficult they are. So I think that giving feedback is Really that. And the other thing is that when people ask theoretical questions, you know, sometimes you give a theoretical answer, but you know there's a follow-up question because they have not really asked the question. So you should anticipate the follow-up question. So when you give the feedback, you anticipate in advance what's the follow-up question that they're going to put out there. So I think, so, but if you want to anticipate it, you kind of need to know the reasons why that person is asking the questions. And so that means you really have to think a little bit deeply before you answer the questions because you don't just answer the question, but if you just answer the question, this follow up. But if you have anticipated it, you, you come with a much more comprehensive input. The third uh, aspect of feedback is there are people out there that genuinely want to know how to apply the principles of transformational leadership. And so when you do that, you should be very, very practical about the how-to aspects of it. So I'm very concerned about people asking questions and when they want to know the guardrails or the step-by-step ways of doing it, it's important to be able to give the feedback in a manner that's constructive and practical. How do you ensure that feedback is constructive? Let's say if you are the one providing the feedback, um, do you have any sort of top tips to ensure or frameworks to ensure that your feedback given uh, is constructive? You would not know that in the beginning because someone asked a very simple question in the beginning. They kind of want to trap you if they don't intend to know real answers to it. So if that person keep asking the same question repetitively, then you should pause and ask the question. Perhaps I have already answered the question to the best of my ability today. Do you have any other question? Try and change the topic to a different one because you've already answered it many times. Clearly, there are people who are not interested in getting the the questions answered. They just want to trip you for reasons they don't agree. So I think as I mentioned in the earlier discussions on winning coalition, our role in transformational leadership is to provide the answers so that the reform that you're going to implement are explained to them in a manner they can understand it, but they're not going to applaud you for doing it. So there are people who are the resistance group. They're going to pose questions and criticism not intended to be constructive. This is good in terms of learning about or or discussing how we receive feedback, how do we discern uh, what kinds of questions to address and how to then address them based on the nature of the question. You know, I've been thinking uh, quite a bit about this lately, um, about myself uh, and how do I create an environment for my teams to be able to give me feedback. When people talk about leadership, there's a tendency to always think, okay, how do we give feedback to our teams? Um, But actually, I think a large percentage um, actually of your role of being a leader is also to ensure that your teams feel that there's a a safe space for them to bring feedback to you because that helps you to improve as a leader as well. So I've just been thinking about some very basic guardrails for for giving feedback and these are things that I feel have worked for me with my interactions with my past managers and mentors. Uh, I think the first thing is when the feedback has a focus on the future, i.e. I'm giving you a piece of feedback but I'm positioning it in a way that focuses on not so much of what went wrong, although that is the starting point, but it's what went wrong and now 
in light of how this can make you better in the future and painting that scenario. So it's a bit like your true north principle. When you set what the true north is, it's easier for people to, even in in the face of adversity, move past it to continue to head towards the true north. So I think making sure that whatever feedback you give is always in the context of how this will help the person grow. So it's not just about you pinpointing um, errors. The other thing, um, which I'm, I'm sure you agree with as well, it's, it's very much in your Pamandu ethos, but it's about specificity. I think if we are very specific about our feedback, that helps people to not only know exactly what it is we are talking about and how it can be better, but it also shows that you as a leader has, you know, that you have as a leader have taken the time to really think and go through what, what the error was um, and to spend time uh, in the feedback. Because I think that is another portion of feedback. Um, you, can, you can have all of the right content in the things that you are picking out. But actually, if you demonstrate to your teams that you have really spent time to work on being very specific on that feedback, it shows them that actually you are, that you are invested in their growth as well. And then the third thing is, you know, a question that I like to ask is, after I have gotten my teams to then uh, maybe think of their own solution to how they can uh, do better or improve on, on something that we have debriefed about, I would usually just end the meeting with asking, okay, that, that sounds good. How, how, can I, how can I help? I think that shows, again, that there's a level of buy-in from leadership and that you are, that again, you are invested um, in whatever the problem uh, that you are trying to solve is. And then the, the classic thing is obviously, you know, sandwiching it between uh, positive feedback. So, you know, that's why whenever we do our weekly one-to-ones, the structure of our one-to-one, we talked about this in a previous episode as well, but the structure is always, you know, before we go into uh, areas of feedback, we always ask the person, where are you winning this week? Or where did you win last week? Get them to paint a positive picture. It gives you a space to then also affirm that and celebrate that. But then we move into where are you challenged this week. This gives them the opportunity to raise issues if there are, without you having to be the one to call it out. Um, but even if if they have not had maybe the self-awareness to, to bring that up, uh, you've at least created that expectation that in the week, we're always going to cover a where are you challenged portion. And then in that, you as a manager have freedom to raise that um, and then to problem solve as necessary. And then I've also just thought the other thing that is useful, and this is just a language thing, is whenever I uh, want to check in on something, I usually give them, I usually give my team members the benefit of the doubt. And so my previous, um, one of my previous managers did this very well with me. She would always preface whatever it is, let's say if she wanted to follow up on something, um, she would always preface that with, I'm sure you might have already thought of this or you might have done this already, uh, but X. So actually when you do that, if you have already thought about it, there's less likelihood of you thinking, why, why is this person uh, hounding me? I've already done this because she's already acknowledged or you as a leader have already acknowledged, yeah, perhaps you have already looked into this um, but if not, it's, a, it's also a gentle way to remind someone to, to get on top of that thing uh, without it seeming like you are hawking um, over them. So I think those are just some, some basic uh, things that I feel that have worked out for me. I think based on that, are there maybe some examples that you want to share that might be sort of in line with some of those uh, points that we uh, talked about? There are many people that provide feedback. Sometimes the feedback are seen as resistance type of questions. There are genuine feedback that are meant to improve the process, the constructive types of uh, ones. So I always look for the ones that are constructive because they say the largest room in the world is the room for improvement. So feedback is the best way to find ways how to improve. I've never so, heard that one before. The largest room, room in, the world in the world is the, the room, room for, for improvement. improvement. Okay, that's a good one. And I've never so, heard that. So when you get feedback, a lot of feedback, you start to put them into two files. One is the, the ones that are really the types of questions and feedback that are intended to improve the reform program. And the other file is the ones that are specific to the question that the person wants to be addressed. They are not really to, uh, to improve, to clarify certain things. The first category is the one that I really focus on because in a reform program, you really have to keep your eyes on the true north, the game, the impossible, and really get that going. So when I was in Malaysia Alliance, I always do that. 
when I was in Shell, in Shell MDS, we put them into two folders. In Shell Sri Lanka, always two, two folders. The first folder, the constructive feedback to improve, that's the one we really tackle. And so when you start looking at that, you bring in those people that are giving the questions. And you will find that they're typically the ones that have the answers to it. And so you involve them in the process. They provide their input and then they feel great about it. Now they are coming into the fore. They're participating in the process to make the improvement. When you start doing that, this movement for the reform becomes larger and larger because a lot more people are coming in. But the second part, you need to spend less time on but need to answer them. There's a very topical question specific to the person that, ans that uh, puts the questions there. Yeah, this is a great segue into this next segment where we want to make this a bit more interactive with uh, you all, our viewers and listeners. Um, so I'm going to just open up. We have a few touch points for questions. So we put out an IG story the other day. Um, I'm just going to look through some of these. One that stands out there, uh, two people who have basically said that we reference our spouses quite a lot in these episodes. Would you consider episodes with either this is this was posed i suppose it's posed to me uh, your mom uh, or your wife uh. <laughs> that is a good question so that goes into the first folder yes the constructive feedback to improve so i would suggest that we do that one of these episodes we yeah. bring andrea and and, and Ngan. yeah and then they participate in the con uh, wonderful that's a classic example of folder number one we also have an outlier. <laughs> I know this person. <laughs> What's the favorite blues jam track for the Jala boy? <laughs> well, we do quite a lot of jamming at home, Leon and I. As you know, there was one particular episode that we've had many, many years ago. A few, a couple of years, maybe even last year. Two years ago. Two years ago, we, we jam on a track. It's a, very, it's a blues with a little bit of swing to it. And that's, I think, our favorite. That is our sweet spot. Uh, if you want to watch that, uh, this was on a podcast that uh, that we did for actually for my church. It's called On Leadership. So you can search On Leadership on YouTube or uh, I, I, on Spotify as well. Um, and then just, I think the title of that podcast was How to 10X Your Goals. Yeah. Uh, and in that podcast, uh, again, I think that was kind of the start of us uh, thinking, hey, maybe this could be an interesting format because in that episode, um, I conducted the interview and it was with you as well. Our first foray into a father-son uh, format. So if you want to check it out, um, go give that a listen. Uh, there's a little segment in there where we kind of jam it out a little. Uh, I'm just going to look through some more questions. The other question was, um, hmm, this is a question on IG, but also we posted our first ever TikTok snippet, um, which had about, right now, I think it's at about 100,000 views. And many people asked the same question, which was um, essentially, would Pamandu, uh, would you consider uh, setting up a similar delivery unit uh, to assist the current administration, the Madani um, government? I had two uh, discussions with our Prime Minister and uh, he was asking me uh, some input to what they should be doing. And so I shared what we did when I was there with him. He did ask me to put up a proposal for how we might be able to help. And so I think we are still awaiting his, uh, his response to that. I certainly would be prepared, my team and I, to provide input to help the government. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so that addresses that one. The other one is... Um Ezra asked, it's easy to lose personal vision. What are ways to keep grounded? You have to be very clear about your true north. So if you're not nailing the true north very clearly, you will get distracted by all sorts of personal vision and things that are bothering you, that the emotions that get in the way uh, in the journey. So if you are clear about your true north, you will not get distracted. That is why we are so clear in episode number two, on anchoring on true north because that is the one that grounds everything so that you do not get distracted. Every single day, leaders are bombarded with firefighting questions and issues. And if you get caught and get dragged and vortex into firefighting, then you lose track of where you are really trying to get your organization to go forward to. On that topic, where um, have there been examples in the past where you have felt most... Uh, 
either where you have been sidetracked from your true north or where you have felt the most uh, inclined to being sidetracked or distracted? I think in my case, the only time I've kind of felt that I was distracted from the true north was, it was in my assessment of what, where we are in, in, the, in the face of the journey. And uh, so I think when I left Malaysia Airlines, I kind of thought we were already in the phase four stage of the journey. That means the production phase. That means things were moving. That the, the, the reforms were already sticky enough. They were sustainable and there were no way, no way of turning back. So that was my assessment. But I think on hindsight now, I think about we were still in the resolution phase the third phase. We were not really in the production phase. When I agreed uh, with the invitation of the Prime Minister to, uh, to leave Malaysia Alliance, join him as a minister in the cabinet, I already had the view that we were already in phase four. So handing over at that point in time, I thought it was okay. So in many sense, if I had been quite clear that we were in phase four or still phase three and not phase four, I would have said no. I would have stayed on. And so you could say my me, me leaving Malaysia Alliance to become a minister was a distraction to the journey because it was premature. Interesting. Interesting. Do you think though, um, so premature um, for, for the airline potentially, um, but do you think if there was a chance to go back and you know rewind the clock and to change, alter the timeline um, so that your kind of uh, economic transformation journey, um, socio-economic transformation journey with the government, if that were to be deferred to the following year, do you think that that would have had any impact on the outcomes um, ultimately? Certainly. And I'm totally convinced that if I had stayed on a little longer, maybe two more years into the job, we would have really made the reform, the change program sticky. That means they will not reverse to the old way of doing it. The new way of doing things will become institutionalized and embedded. Yeah. Sorry, my question is more for, for all, of the, all the things that you did within government. Do you think that if that were to be delayed by another two years, would that have had an impact on that outcome? I don't think so, because the problem will always be there. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> the problem will always be there and they will never change. And so the fundamental problem in government is always that making changes in government is not an overnight thing. Rome was never made, uh, built overnight in a day. So in the same thing, government, the issues of poverty will always be there. Relative poverty is there. Even in the, in the USA, there are 35 million Americans who live on food stamps. This is one of the countries that every put, put on the pedestal as the example, a classic example in capitalist world, but they still have a lot of people that are relatively poor. So the problem of relative poverty will always be there. And so I would say the problem in Malaysia will always be there. <laughs> Even if I came two years later <laughs> into the job, it still be there. Yeah, I think it takes, we often take for granted um, the importance actually of being, uh, you know, willing to accept um, maybe things that could have been done differently as a leader. Um, you know, case in point, you now, and this is the first time I'm actually hearing you say this, that perhaps that, that transition could have happened a bit later, that might have been better for the airline. For many people, I think myself included, uh, in the past, I've often found it actually quite difficult to, to receive feedback, but then sometimes, you know, even more so to then openly say uh, that something went wrong. I mean, obviously I, I do that now, but that has required a, a lot of conditioning um, over the years. What are helpful uh, maybe mindsets or, or frames uh, for people to be a bit more kind of self-aware and uh, I think vulnerable and open about maybe mistakes made in the past? The most important thing, Leon, is that self-awareness come through frequent self-reflection. That is why I keep on saying, make it a practice once in two weeks in solitude by yourself, reflecting on what you have done in the last week, last two weeks, what have you done right? What are the areas you think you didn't do really well? And be as brutal and honest with yourself 
in that quiet reflection. And if you start to do that, you become very, very self-aware. You know many things about what you're doing right and wrong. I think the best person to look at himself and herself for improvements is yourself. To look at, the, at yourself in the mirror and make the corrective changes. In many sense, you are now giving feedback to yourself because you're now looking into the mirror and then you will now make the correction. One, one question to that. Do you think that there's ever a point at which uh, being too, um, too, too vulnerable um, or too, too open about your weaknesses becomes then, uh, 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 puts you in a bad position with, let's say, team members? How do we prevent kind of a mob culture of, of forming uh, within our teams or organizations? I think it's, it's, it's a balance that you need to put out there. If you keep on just talking about what I call self-flagellation, that means you keep looking at yourself and then whipping yourself for all uh, your sins and your weaknesses, of course, that is not good because then people lose confidence in you as a leader. So you need to give confidence that you are okay and you are steady and you know what you're doing. And in the process, when you do that, you put the positive things and you give the confidence, you have the confidence, then you will say, these are areas we're going to make improvements. Because in leadership, authenticity is very important. And people who think that they have no weaknesses, no areas for improvement, people will see through them. And so, much as you think you're not an open book, to staff, leaders are an open book. And so it's very important to be authentic. To be able, don't go and paper over it, don't go and cover and don't pretend because people know. And so it's good that you must keep the confidence, but at the same time, you are very prepared to open up in areas for improvement. And that I think if you put that balance there, you get a lot of respect. And I'm my own experience, Leon, over time, I realized this. There are a lot more positive than being more open than not being more open. And so the truth will set you free. So in the end, whatever you do, if you're honest and you're very open about it, there are rough edges in the process that you need to tackle, but in the long run, it'll pace. Mm. Yeah. The truth will set you free. So that is a biblical principle, but I think there are, there's, there's also a very practical implication to that. I mean, it's why, I'm, I think we touched on this in the previous episode, but it's why things like therapy works because when something is brought to light, uh, whether it's in written format or whether it's verbally, I personally feel that it's more effective when it's in written format because then you, as the person who has put that issue forward, you've now also got a very visual reference point to see that issue um, in writing. But there's something about when those things are brought into the light, um, you realize that number one, it maybe gives you a bit more clarity on how to deal with it. Um, but usually you also find that it's, the issue is probably not as uh, not as big or as damning um, as you might think of it if it were to remain in your head. And sometimes that can become very paralyzing when you're met with an issue uh, and it remains in your head. You you know we 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 are our own worst critic. And so what tends to happen is we can uh, you know tend to magnify certain issues. And the bigger the issue becomes in your head, uh, sometimes the less, likely, the less likely you are to actually take action to resolve it. Because now it seems like this big daunting thing versus when you've put it on paper, you realize, actually, I, not only have I been able to identify the steps needed, but actually, you know what, it's not, it's maybe not as difficult to tackle as I thought. And also, and the other thing is when we do that, I've often found that, um, you know, uh, Andrea, my, my wife, likes to say this. If ever I have maybe messed up in something, um, one way that she would encourage me, it's, it, I used to think it was rather counter <laughs> counterproductive, but, you know, rather than kind of coddling me, of course, she would, she would do a little bit of that. But then she would go very quickly into this, this line that always, has always stuck with me, which is, it's not about you. Not everything is about you. And then that really brings me to a place of realizing, actually, yeah. Um, the first time she said that, I was a bit offended. <laughs> by it. I said, hey, why are, you not, why are you not giving me encouragement and support? But then I realized, actually, it was very yeah, encouraging yeah, yeah. because it reminds you, first of all, yeah. to kind of snap out of it. Yeah. Um, but you snap out of it because, actually, when you think of an issue mm. uh, through the lens of the thing not being about you, yeah, yeah, you sure. remove one whole layer. So for me, as... Um, 
as as a creative, naturally, I my tendency is whatever I whatever I, I create, whether it's this podcast, whether it is a, a PowerPoint deck, uh, I tend to attach a bit of myself to the work, mm. uh, which makes mm. me, mm. Uh, you know, mm. obviously a bit more affected if it is if it is criticized. Mm. Um, but actually, when I remind myself that it's not about me, it means that I can really take the issue. At, at, at face like at face value i don't have to i don't have to have this added lens of the perhaps embarrassment of something not going my way and i can now look at the issue purely from okay how did it affect other people did this uh maybe this presentation that i wasn't uh, wasn't entirely prepared for uh rather than thinking about how did that make me look um, as an individual, remove that, and now I can think. Okay, did that really? Uh, how did that really affect our listeners? If there's a case for okay, because you weren't so prepared, perhaps your audience, your clients, uh, your congregation members couldn't quite grasp your main point. Mm. Maybe it wasn't as clear. Then I can say, okay, it's. Then I have to address how can I be clearer. So you 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 get out of wallowing over the issue. You go straight into problem solving, and it's very clear problem solving. Um, or sometimes when you do that and you think, well, how did it affect other people? You might actually realize that that mistake is something that only you are aware about, and mm. you wished it could have gone different. But if you think about the true north, right, which right. is to present a solid case, sometimes you might find that actually. This did not. This was not at the expense of your audience understanding your message, and therefore, actually, maybe it's not as big of an issue as you think um, it is. So, I've personally found that very, very helpful. And also, as a leader, whenever I think of things through that lens, it means that um, it helps me to just adopt a posture of service once more. When you realize that the thing is not about you, but that your role as a leader is to um, create the best environment for your teams. Um, to provide clarity, um, I think that sends a, it sends a message to your teams that uh, you are not uh, a narcissistic leader, mm. uh, but that ultimately you are in there uh, for their best interest. And I think if they are able to see uh, you modeling how to how to refine, how to iterate on yourself as you go, that sets a good example for them uh, to be able to do the same, to have that same uh, openness about their own mistakes, uh, and then to have that same proactive um, and very objective approach to to get better. So, it's not always about you. That <laughs> has been uh, that has been the song of yeah. the last couple of years for me. Um, I wonder, do you? I mean, I we've talked about some questions on IG uh, based on what I have uh, optics on. I wonder, have you? You've been uh, very diligently sending out. Uh, WhatsApp messages of each episode to your networks, and I know you've had some feedback as well, uh, some some questions that people have asked. Anything that, that you want to to raise? There is one person that posed a lot of questions to me on a very uh, contentious issue, and but he didn't want his name to be disclosed here. He's called Mister Anonymous. He calls himself. He says, "Guys, as a Bumi Putra, what do you think Malaysia should do with the new economic policy?" What reform can we do? How can we do it? My response is that I always felt that this is our equivalent of the US and their gun laws. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a checkmate it's a, it's situation. A checkmate very politically, diff very difficult. This, so he kept asking that question. So my view is very simple. I am of the view that Malaysia has reached a stage in its history that we should get rid of the new economic policy. We should get rid of it, but we do not get rid of it and leave a vacuum. We should get rid of it and replace it. I think we should replace with a new policy that deals with the B40, regardless of race and religion. That means you still in, implement an affirmative action policy, but it's focused on the B40. As it's turned out, more than 70% of the people in the B40 are the Bumi Putras anyway. But there are the Chinese, the Indians and other races in it as well. And so I think that's much, much better way of tackling it. So in my view, I think Malaysia has reached a time, mature enough reached a time that we should get rid of the new economic policy, but do not leave a vacuum. Replace it with an affirmative action policy that deals with the B40 regardless of race and religion. As it turned out, 70% of those people in the B40 are Bumi Putra anyway, but, but you also embrace the poor from the other races. 
while we're on that topic, um, I think another one that is usually hotly debated um, is GST. Ah, GST. <laughs> and it's something that I think a lot of people have, have often commented, uh, you know, your, your naysayers in the past um, have usually referenced GST as one of the, in their eyes at least, uh, one of the worst things <laughs> that you had proposed yeah. in your time in yeah, government. Yeah, but I think um, there are more than 130 over countries in the world that they implemented GST and they call it VAT. Most of the countries in ASEAN have already done. There are only two countries in ASEAN that haven't done it, and that's Brunei because they know taxes, they know income taxes. But at the same time, there's Myanmar, but everybody else, Indonesia, Singapore, Philippines, Thailand, they all have done it. More than 134 countries, and still counting, in the world have done it because it's really very good. It's a much more effective tax system than the current system that the government have. And our estimate was if, if we keep GST at even 6%, the average in, in ASEAN is around 10. But even at a modest 6%, at that time, the calculation, if it's properly implemented, we get an additional 30 billion ringgit uh, to the coffer of the country annually. And that's a lot of money. We can do so many things with that to improve poverty, to improve education, improve public transport. There's so many things. Malaysia needs money but we can't rely on just income tax to be the main contributor for the government's coffer to do it because there's only 1.4 million malaysians who are paying income taxes and there are altogether more than 31 million malaysians in, in our day so i think it's very important i'm of the view that sooner or later malaysia will have to do it it's better to do it now rather than later mm. You, you, you talked about um, the state of our economy um, and obviously with our ringgit um, falling. Um, why, why, why do you think that is? Three reasons, I think. One reason is that issue around investments. If you see the government make a lot of pronouncements about approved investment, but when you look at the actual realized investments that are of year on year, it is not that impressive. So there are some fundamental issues that we need to improve in Malaysia to improve the investments coming into other countries. So if a lot of foreign investment coming in, and of course the ringgit will increase in its value. So that's one very important thing, investment. I am of the view that more than 70% of the approved projects are not realized because of government bureaucracy. And so it's very important to follow the prescription from the World Bank. The World Bank have given a whole list of the things you can do for ease of doing business. So it's not difficult, not rocket science. All Malaysia need to do is take the top two countries in the world, that is Singapore and possibly New Zealand and Switzerland and those ones, and just look at their rule book on all the ways how to improve it, cut and paste. Remove the name of those countries, put Malaysia then and implement it. So that's one. And if you do that, you will have massive increase in realized investments. And that will prop the ringgit. That's one. Number two, you will not notice in the last few years that the US Fed have been increasing their interest rates. And because they have been increasing their interest rates, money flowing into the US economy it's much, much higher than here because relative, our interest rate is low. A lot of people may not like it, but I am of the view that our central bank need to increase its interest rates because if you keep it at such a low rate, the differential is causing money flowing more towards the, the, the U.S. and less. So that's against the U.S. dollar, our ringgit has devalued very significantly. So that's a, th a second reason. A third one is general confidence. This is sentiment. So if you run a government more efficiently, you have a lot more confidence all around. And so the confidence on consumer confidence, confi uh, business confidence, and all of these things come part and, part and parcel. So the more PMX implement reforms, the more the reforms are the ones that hit all the right buttons in the eyes of the world, in the business community, the consumers, and trade as well, then the more the confidence will come. So those are very important three points. So uh, to, su su to summarize, private e investment is key. We have to improve our ease doing business. Secondly, we have to then 
make a radical change in the way we peg our interest rates relative to the US. Uh, that's the second one. And the third one is just making sure that the reforms are implemented so that we bring in the confidence. Reforms all around, comprehensive reform in our economy, in our government, and the way we do things here. And when you start to do it, the bus is going to come in there. And then uh, that's how the ringgit will come in. What are your hopes for the country? Well, I mean, the hopes is that uh, we have a prime minister who has spent more than 20 over years talking about reform, and that's PMX. And I really hope that he used this opportunity as being a unity government. And it's for the first time in a very long time, we have the opposition. They, I mean, they were you know, sworn enemies. They are, they are together in the, in the government. Golden opportunity. We have a prime minister that spent more than 20 years talking about wanting to put reform. We have a unity government that's made of almost non-partisan inside there, almost. And so this is a golden opportunity to make the changes happen. So my hope is that uh, our prime minister really take this golden opportunity to make the reform run quicker than he does today. And I think we, the world, the world needs to move much quicker and Malaysia needs to move much, much quicker than we do today in implementing those reforms. Very good. I think we can wrap up today's episode. Um, we want to leave more content in the bag, uh, but we also want to give more opportunity for uh, you, our viewers, and also our listeners to just submit your questions. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can drop a comment uh, in the comment section. But if you're listening, you can also follow us on Instagram, on our IG, where we put up a weekly uh, kind of um, ask for questions. So, you know, drop your questions and we'd love to cover them in our next episode. We've also got a few in the bank that we were not able to cover today, but, you know, over time, we'll, we will continue to collect our bank of questions and uh, we, will, we will aim to um, answer them. Thank you all for your contributions. And also, while we're on the topic of feedback, please let us know if there are any suggestions, any ideas that you think that could help to make um, this format a bit more engaging for all of you. Thank you all for listening and for watching watching.